Welcome to the Seahawkers Podcast with your host, Adam Emmert. Not every year of my life has been a steady transition to more awesome. Maybe have some perspective, people. And Brandon Schultz. Now that they have Blitz for Six, there is no way the Patriots are going to win a Super Bowl. Thank you. Go Hawks! This is the Seahawkers podcast. I'm Brandon Schultz of the Military Seahawkers. And joining me, my good buddy and Montana Seahawker, Adam Emmert. Happy Combine Day, Brandon. Are you excited? Today is the start of the Combine. It's, I'm something. <laughs> <laughs> it's football related and it's happening. Like, yeah. I got to listen to football terms and, you know, watch guys and spandex run around. And yeah, it was interesting enough. I'm glad that there's other people out there that are much more into this than me that can tell me what's important <laughs> to know and what's not important to know. Because like right. I Seahawks draft blog it, at this time of year when Rob Staten, it's yes. it's my go to place because Rob knows. Yeah. He, not only does he know Seahawks, but he knows scouting. And so I know I can count on the information that's there and it's going to be much more related to the Seahawks than any other mock draft that's out there. Any other scouting that predicts certain guys to go to the Seahawks. Rob knows. Rob knows he does a great job of that. And uh, hopefully we'll get to talk to him here uh, leading up to the draft. That'd be really great. I always enjoy our conversations with him. But you're right. He's he's fairly accurate and has realistic views of what the Seahawks do and don't look for. So definitely check out his site. No doubt about it. Well, and the important thing is knowing what the Seahawks actually need. All you have to do is listen to what Pete Carroll said a couple weeks ago as to what their team needs are. And in the past, when Pete Carroll has said, these are our team needs, these are the needs that we're going to address this offseason, they've gone out and done it. He doesn't blow smoke as to as to what the Seahawks are actually going out to look for, either in free agency or the draft. Yeah, for the most part, him and Schneider have been fairly straightforward. I found it interesting in John Schneider's press conference this week that he mentioned the idea that uh, these days that, yeah, you kind of do just have to draft for need in a, in a way. So. Yeah. I mean, it's it's definitely important. And so, yeah, you got to recognize those areas of need. Uh, we know a few of those, that's for sure. And I know there's a lot of stories to discuss this week, Brandon, uh, about different ways that we could address those needs, whether that's in the draft or in free agency, or if you can convince your mom to come and play left tackle. <laughs> so uh, we've got a lot of, lot, of, lot of ways that we can go about this, a lot of articles to talk about. I think this should be fun pod. Yeah, I don't know if my mom at left tackle will be an upgrade, but uh, we will talk about whatever. <laughs> Glenda would Glenda would rock it out there. She she crush people. They, she crush people. She just have to give them that look, you know. Yeah, like yeah, and it'd be over. Like, don't you touch my quarterback? Yeah, yeah. There is nobody who would more fiercely protect Russell Wilson <laughs> than your mom. Well, we are going to get into I think you were talking about free agents that are out there. So we're going to get into some yeah. free agency talk this week, who the Seahawks should should look at to target. Yeah, uh, I want to talk about, like you mentioned, Pete Carroll and John Schneider both talked at the combine this week. We have a few clips from some of the things that they said, and uh, we will get into the tone from those interviews and some of the important takeaways. You bet, man. Also. Uh, one thing that I want to make sure that we that I really want to focus on this week, Richard Sherman was in the news and I'm now convinced, Adam, that the media is out to get Richard Sherman. So we, we're going to talk about this. Well, you make yourself a target enough times and uh, yeah, you could end up in the crosshairs. There's no doubt about it. But uh, I you, you gave me a glimpse into your theory. I'm not sure I completely understand it yet. I don't know exactly where your head's at on this, but uh, I'm going to be interested to hear this one. I don't know. Hey, does he need to produce a birth certificate at any time now? Like, is this that big of a conspiracy theory? Or I, like, I don't even know if it's a conspiracy theory. It's just I have questions, and I, I wouldn't be shocked if the media is out to get him. But I wouldn't be shocked if it's just him shooting himself in the foot again either. So I'm, I'm open to all ideas, but right. there, there's some questions that I have. We're gonna so go more over just them. a couple hypotheses. That you want to work through yeah. some other other possible explanations for the phenomenon that's going on in Richard Sherman's life right now. Right. OK. And we'll get to, of course, do better and better at life. Perfect. All right. Well, let's kick off with kind of what's in the biggest news. The combine, Adam, mm -hmm. watching these guys run. I, I have to say, 
watching you run in the snow was slightly more entertaining. But uh, we do have interviews with Coach Carroll and and John Schneider this week. All I know is those guys running out there on that perfectly manicured field. Whatever. What a bunch of wusses, man. Yeah, but get some snow up to your knees, put on a hard hat, and do it like a real man. I was just disappointed with the level of uh, competition out there. Everybody took the easy way out, ran with cleats and on perfectly manicured grass. It was it was lame. Obstacles would make it much more entertaining, and I yes. think it would improve their um, just how teams look at them. Right, like anybody can run a forty in a straight line with shorts on. Yeah, yeah. I mean, even me. Right. Like, so, yeah, that's kind of the idea, too. Right. Uh, especially uh, running backs ran today. And you know, while you get a sense of overall speed, I guess, I mean, how many 40 yard runs is a dude breaking off in a in a game? Yeah. I mean, or in a season even. And if you're not going to break four, four, make it interesting. Yeah, exactly. Plus, what throw some obstacles out there. I'm more. I'm more interested in your cutting ability, your vision, like yeah. a lot of different things. Then, I mean, Le'Veon Bell ran four six, right? Four six, and I mean, he runs even slower behind that Steelers offensive line. Why he sits sits back there, has a cup of tea, like you know, reads a, a few of the blocks, and then you know, pens a letter to his best childhood friend, and like puts it in the mail, and then decides <laughs> to pick a hole and run. Like he literally like takes some time and just you know hangs out. So speed is. The, the speed aspect of it, the 40, I think, is probably the uh, least interesting event at the Combine, in my humble opinion. Oh, yeah. The three cone. That's that's where it's at. And then, and then you get, see guys like changing directions. Sure. I watched uh, watch offensive linemen today at the Combine. And uh, man, I'll tell you one thing, Brandon. I don't know anything more than I did the two <laughs> hours that I that I knew that I didn't know two hours beforehand. Like I, I don't understand how in the world you'd be able to look at those guys doing these random drills and have any freaking clue what these guys can do. All the one thing that I took away from it, Brandon, is if you're going to be evaluating offensive line, apparently you need to have a hip fetish. Like you need to be <laughs> into hip, hips. yeah, hip hip flex. Uh, uh, dip your hips. Your how fast you open your hips. You know, hip flexibility, uh, hip quickness, hip fluidity, all about the hips. My favorite offensive line drill is when they have them lie flat on their back and they have to get up quickly and then run. Because right. how many times do you see guys just laying on their back? And I mean, that's an important skill to to measure, right? Because you have to be able to get up off your back all the time when you're blocking. Apparently, if you have hip stiffness, you can't get up off your back very quickly. Oh, I learned that from Mac, Mike Mayock. This that's week. why they do that. Yeah, sure. Uh, sure. <laughs> I, I just I don't know, man. I, I just don't. Short of like things where like the vertical jump and the broad jump and the bench press and, and things of that nature, yeah. like actual physical tests. I don't know what you get out of all these other drills. I, I just I think that. Those other things are trying to figure out movement abilities, footwork, things like that. I think you just got to watch their their college film. I, I just I can't imagine that you really get that much out of these drills, man. At least I didn't. Yeah, you're just not refined enough at the at the scouting techniques, because to me, this is a lot like drinking wine. Like I can drink a, a glass of wine. and I go, yep, it tastes like wine. It's like watching offensive line guys run. Yep, there's a there's a big dude running. Well, and it's a proven fact too. Like with the wine, like the ten dollar wine and the forty dollar wine are basically the same wine. Like they've done a lot of different taste tests and done all that, and it's the same thing. And it feels very much that way when you're looking at these offensive linemen. Um, the kid from Alabama, Greg Robinson, I think his name is. He's the number one tackle on the board for most people, or whatever. Cam Robinson, yeah, yeah. Every time he would do anything, I mean, oh, look at him, look at him move, look at how fluid, look at all this, look at all that. And then some dude that nobody's ever heard of is out there doing something looks exactly the same <laughs> doing it. And like they, they're not effusing him with praise. You know, I mean, it's just ridiculous. I don't know. There were two dudes, though. There were two dudes, though, Brandon. There are two dudes that stood out to you. There were. There were with it. With all that said, number one, I just got to say, I love lamp. <laughs> I love lamp. Forrest lamp, man. I like this guy. He's got he's got all the skills and. It, he falls into that sea hockey kind of uh, mold that they look for. That he was a top performer in the bench press, top performer in the forty. He's uh, he jumped over one hundred nine inches. He had one hundred eleven inches uh, broad jump, 
you love lamp <laughs> yeah <laughs> so I, I i like him a lot and then the other guy was this dude garcia uh i can't remember what school he's out of but uh He's kind of nasty, man. Like, he was popping people out there. And it's like, it's his underwear Olympics, dude. And it didn't matter. And he's still, and he was just underneath the 109 broad jump threshold that apparently the Seahawks mm. kind of have. He had 108 inch uh, broad jump. So I kind of liked him, too. Those are the two guys. Well, this is going to be a little bit of a shock to you, but you agree with Pete Prisco then because he mock drafted Forrest Lamp to the Seahawks. I love lamp, so I like that's fine. If 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 they want to do that, uh, I'd be excited. Now, from the little bit that I read, apparently he played left tackle in college and was good. Uh, it, but everybody, a lot of people haven't projected a guard instead. Mm-hmm. I don't want a guard. I yeah. want a left tackle. And uh, basically, the big uh, knock on him is his levers are not long enough. Not so. long levers. And actually, Rob <laughs> yeah. Staten, the Seahawks draft blog, pointed out the Seahawks only have one guy uh, with arms shorter than 33 inches, and that's your backup right. center. And uh, right. Forrest Lamp also has arms less than 33 inches. So Right. Well, how are those 33-inch arms working out as a whole? Like, I mean, it, 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 it hasn't exactly been great because it turns out it's hard to pick offensive linemen, Brandon. It's hard to evaluate them. Yeah, and we learned that from, uh, from John Schneider this week. Before we get to John, let, let's start off with Pete Carroll because – I, I feel like I got less out of uh, out of what Pete Carroll said. Oh, but, man. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that was, that was a big nothing burger for the most part. My my favorite, because they asked him why they have a ton of success drafting defensive backs. And, and what does Coach Carroll look for in a defensive back? There's certain aspects we look for, and it just depends on what kind of player he is, what kind of athlete he is, how his speed fits with his size and weight and all that kind of junk. And uh so there's a, so I told you absolutely nothing. OK, is what I was my goal there. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. 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 We like guys that have different characteristics depending on their size and their speed and, you know, uh, things and all that and, junk <laughs> and how they look in uh, pants. You know, like it, it, exactly. It's unbelievable. The one thing that I did take away from Pete Carroll, though, is. Again, this focus on the run game. I think they really do want to have that one two punch when it comes to the running game and and whether or not they have that with the guys that they have. I know they're very concerned about the injuries. Coach Carroll definitely wants that one two punch. You know, it's important today to have two running backs rather than just one guy. Uh, I've always thought that it's really valuable when you can have two guys or, or three guys that you can work um, and have have not had any hesitation to go all the way back to our college days um, and still feel like that. If there's a guy that's so dominant that nobody else de- deserves the play time, then, then you've got a great one. And, and uh, so I don't know if it's any more so to answer your question. No, I don't think any more so today than before. Um, I, we've always been advocate of, of, you know, like a one two punch kind of a, a formula. Yeah, that was something that he talked about. It doesn't surprise me at all. He talks about the running game, closing the circle of toughness all the time. And just the idea, too, that you control the ball. You're you're just more in control of a game when you can just run it down somebody's throat. There's not a lot they can do about it if you can just physically just pound it down uh, down the field and there's nothing they can do to stop it. So I wouldn't be surprised if you see them – draft a, a running back uh, fairly high in this draft, another another back. I wouldn't be shocked. And apparently this draft is deep on running backs. I watched them run their 40s today. They all run a 4-5. So, I mean, they, yeah. they're all fast enough you know, for the most part. Uh, so it's just kind of, you know, pick your poison. If you even want to spend draft capital on a running back, I mean, again, we got Thomas Rawls undrafted. But then again, you get ProSize uh, early in last year's draft. So, yeah, I mean, it's just a Depends on what you're after. But I, I wouldn't be surprised, especially with the news coming out this last week that the Seahawks pick up two third round compensatory picks. They now have mm-hmm. five picks in the first 110 guys. And uh, you saw that's where they got pro last year was in that compensatory pick for the third round. There's going to be guys there. And having five picks where you can you can focus on potentially, you know, defensive interior, you can focus on offensive line, you know, maybe running back linebacker, Uh, you can corner a corner. You could address all your needs that you're looking at in those positions Mm -hmm. and still get uh, a running back in the first three rounds. And that's not, you know, you know, the Seahawks are going to trade out of that first pick to accumulate more picks. 
<laughs> are they? <laughs> I, I, because I, I mean, there's a chance. There's a chance that you actually use it. I mean, there's a chance. They did, yeah. You, so you think last year was just a tendency breaker? Now they're going to go back to, uh, you know, going back to just trading. Well, they traded uh, the down last year. Time. They had uh, they traded to Denver yeah. just to move back yeah. a few slots. And they yeah, picked still up got their dude. Though. They still got their yeah. dude. And they added uh, they were able to move up in the second round because of uh, the picks they accumulated. Look, if Lamp is there and uh, you can trade down and still get him, I'm fine. Yeah, I'm fine. with That's, that. that's your guy, yeah. though. You're you're sold on him. Yeah, I like Lamp a lot. Yeah. The thing that plus that's a great name. Forrest Lamp. <laughs> I, yeah, that is a great name. Yeah, I want I want him on our team. <laughs> I really do. One thing that bothers me is people looking at the draft and saying, you know, we only have seven picks because we don't have a fourth round pick. There's no pick in the fifth Mm -hmm. round. You know, you have that five picks early on and then you have a couple late round six and seventh rounders. Right. Mm -hmm. And I hear people already wanting to trade away some of the third round compensatory picks because you can this year. Right. Why in the world would you trade down? to get more picks in later rounds. I mean, yes, I know that's how it works I know, when you well, trade. Down. I know we do well <laughs> in, in the fourth and fifth rounds traditionally, right. but if there's better dudes available in the third round, you know, don't, don't trade a, out of guys that are more talented just to get more picks. This team does so well getting undrafted guys that I don't know if you actually need those fourth and round, fifth round picks. It's an interesting thing to think about. Here's the other thing that I would take into account that I think kind of bolsters your argument here, Brandon, is the idea that this team over the next couple of years with the way that the salary cap is, with how we've paid guys and how we're going to have to continue to pay guys uh, to keep this core together, that you really do have to build in the draft. You have to. You're not going to be able to go out on the free agent market and compete with the way the cap goes up and the way the salaries, which we've seen here in just the last couple of weeks, how fast they're increasing. We're not going to be able to compete in free agency, which is fine. It's not a great place to build anyways. So that means you're going to have to find actual starting level players out of the draft with regularity. It's much easier to do that in theory when you get to choose a bunch of dudes relatively early in the draft you're you're drafting from a deeper pool of talent at that point so yeah keep the picks you got use them all and hit every one of them out of the park and you're going to be great and let me ask you a question what's the biggest need okay i was actually going to ask you the same thing so let's let's address uh you know the different positions in which ones like in order well, to me this is easy that- offensive line's the biggest need how many guys and, well, of course and how is. many guys drafted in rounds four through seven do you have playing on the offensive line right now? You got one starter, Mark Lewinsky, who was drafted in the fourth round. You right. have more undrafted guys starting than you do drafted guys that, that came from later rounds. And and you can even go up to two if you count uh, you know, the backup center. So the only guys who have consistently started in their first year were taken in round three and higher for the Seahawks. So to me, it makes no yeah. sense to trade down into rounds four and five when you you need starters on the offensive line and you have mm-hmm. picks traditionally that have started if you get them in the first three rounds. Yeah, and especially in this day and age when you have guys that um, the, just the talent pool of offensive linemen is much smaller than about every other position. One thing that John Schneider brought up in his press conference, which I found interesting, is that one of the reasons he believes that there's not a big uh, dearth of talent of of offensive linemen is the idea that when you're in high school, you don't want to become the best tackle in all of high school. You want to sack the quarterback. You want to play quarterback. You want to catch the ball. You want to play a glory position. So a lot of the more athletic guys and the the people that really are uh, genuine, amazing athletes – these are guys that they gravitate to defensive line or to quarterback or to wide receiver, whatever. So there's just not a lot of dudes out there that start out at offensive line and feel awesome about it. Kind of how the football culture is right now. Like guys aren't like, you know what, I'm going to, the majority of guys aren't like, I'm going to come out and be the best offensive lineman in uh, high school football. <laughs> you know what I mean? They want to sack the quarterback. You know what I mean? So, um, yeah, I, I think that's the one position where you're like, look, I mean, look at us. We played with George Fant last year. I mean, God bless him, but holy cow, I mean, the guy was playing basketball, you know I mean? And he's out there playing against Robert Quinn, you know, so good luck. 
I think that's been like the most uh, honest, honest assessment, assessment of, of George Fence <laughs> that I've heard from the team. God bless him. Yeah. <laughs> I, that's how I know John Schneider listens to the show. How many times did I say, God bless his heart <laughs> like, on the show? He'll bless his heart. Like, oh, man. Yeah, God bless him. He's going up against Robert Quinn. Best of luck. <laughs> yeah. Like, that's not... You don't want to hear that from your general manager about your starting left tackle because asked later on in the press conference, I don't know if it was Pete's or, or, or uh, Schneider's, they were like, yeah, George Fants are starting left tackle. Yeah, right now. Pete Carroll said George like, Fants oh, are starting left tackle. Yeah, and but he right. is right now. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully that'll change. So I think offensive line, sure that uh, that's probably the number one issue. Uh, I think second is probably corner to me. Mm-hmm. If I had to go down the list, third would be defensive line. I would say after that, uh, you could sell me on running back. You could sell me on linebacker. You can kind of go from there, but those those would be the bigger the bigger position groups that I really feel like if you're drafting for need, those are areas we really need to look at. Yeah, I I would agree with all those. I you know whether or not they'll look at, and it just all depends on how it plays out, right? As far as where they're going to look to draft first, I don't think they have to draft an offensive lineman first. You know if if no. uh, Forrest Lamp or they, maybe all the guys are gone that the Seahawks would really like by the time twenty six mm-hmm. rolls around. I mean, I could see an interior defender being picked up early. I could see a pass rusher, edge defender picked up early, a linebacker if he's really athletic and a guy who can cover tight ends. Probably not a guy that you use all that much. But, you know, Coach Carroll has said he wants a guy that can compete with Bobby Wagner and KJ Wright. So maybe you find that guy there. We've talked about the idea of drafting a corner a lot earlier now based on what the other teams are looking for. They're looking for that same sea hockey type model in a corner. So maybe you have to look a little bit earlier rather than later in the draft. Yeah, I, I'm glad you brought that up because that's exactly my thought process. I would not be stunned if they go corner before they go offensive lineman in this draft. And whether that's they pick a corner in the second round or the third, like, but then picking an offensive lineman after yeah. that, I, I would not be surprised. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if they went for uh, another pass rusher uh, before they went offensive line because those are the guys that literally they come off the board the quickest because every team's looking for that. Every single team, every single year. So traditionally, you kind of have to pick them up a little earlier. Well, and if you don't get an offensive lineman, uh, as John Schneider said, maybe Coach Cable can just start uh, recruiting reporters to play on the offensive line. Obviously, you know, we, we feel like we're bust because we feel like we have one of the, you know, if not the best offensive line coach in the league, right? So he feels like he can, you know, put you out there. You know what I mean? So not really, but yeah, no, but no, no, he has, he's got a very positive mindset about, um, you know, improving people and, and, and coaching them up. See, maybe you can play yeah. offensive line, Adam. Hell, I could play at least as well as a traffic cone. <laughs> I know that much. I feel like I feel like that. Now, one thing that I I found interesting from Schneider's comments regarding the offensive line were his comments regarding Jari Evans. Mm, mm-hmm. And uh, one of the reporters asked him, in hindsight, having released Jari Evans in the preseason, uh, do you kind of look back on that with some regret? Yeah, I'd be lying to you if if, if, if I uh, said different. I think that his leadership would have been outstanding for us. Um, I think we got in a position where. You know, we probably got a little bit too young. And I think, you know, some of the best offensive lines I've been around and best teams, quite frankly, are those guys that have a core group of offensive linemen. So we have to have that mentality. So we have to bring these young guys along like we did last year. We brought a bunch of, you know, you know, rookies, second-year guys, move Britt to center, that sort of thing. But they have to have that cohesion, like, you know, with – so in Kansas City we had uh, Tim Grunhardt, Will Shields, and Dave Zott. Those guys are like – you know, played played together for a long time. Criswell was there for a number of years too. Um, in in Green Bay, uh, you know, we, we had you had Mike Flanagan, Wall, Rivera, Clifton, and 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 Tauscher. So, and those guys played together for a long time. And that's like a that group in particular is like a group that has to play with that cohesion and 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 really have have that level of confidence in each other. Yeah, that's a that's a cute idea. Uh, the idea of keeping a few competent guys together for an entire length of time so that the team can be successful. I, it's a, it's a really neat notion. Uh, and the idea too, that 
maybe John Schneider and Pete Carroll learned their lesson a little bit of cutting bait on these veteran offensive linemen a little too freaking quickly. Yeah. And I mean, we've railed about that a million well, and times. The, on the he show. did say they had legitimate concerns about Jari Evans if he was going to be able to stay healthy throughout the season. But you can see those concerns; they did not play out. Unfounded, right? Yeah, yeah. So, and that part of that, it's risk though too. So the idea is all right. So you have legitimate concerns about Jari Evans staying healthy throughout the year. Um, then you put in a, a rookie in his place instead. Now you have legitimate concerns whether your quarterback can stay healthy right. for the year. So, I mean, it's you know, six of one, half a dozen the other there, you know. And honestly, I think six of one being your quarterback really outweighs the half a dozen the other. Like, this guy might get hurt down the well, line. Well, and what happened? But complain. Jer- Jermaine Effetti was the one that got hurt right away and missed the first six weeks mm-hmm. of the season. It would have been awfully nice yeah. to have Jari Evans there in that spot, having a veteran backup. Uh, to fill in while Effetti yes. was out. Yeah, no kidding. So there's that. But so there's some answers possibly in the draft. But Brandon, there's also some answers in free agency yes. when it comes to the offensive line. Um, do you want to? Do you want to make it 2013 again? <laughs> this it it feels like it's time to get the band back together, doesn't it? It does. It does. I'm feeling a reunion tour. <laughs> On, on the way. Well, and one nice thing, just going back to John Schneider, was it was nice to hear that they plan to be aggressive in free agency. It may not work out that they you know collect a lot of oh, players, he but uh, they are, he's aggressive in their approach. We actually, we are aggressive in free agency. We just don't do a lot of deals lately. <laughs> so we try to, you know, we try to pride ourselves in being involved in a lot of deals and then deciding whether, you know, what our threshold is for those deals and, uh, whether that's our own, our own players. And then obviously, you know, what, what that looks like, free agency looks like with, uh, in terms of acquisition, you know, you're constantly evaluating what you're doing and, and trying to reset and refocus. So maybe they'll they'll be aggressive to the point where uh, we can get the band back together because we did find out in this past week, Breno Giacomini cut by the Jets and Russell Okun is going to be let go after his after his uh, first year of his contract. The Broncos will not pick up the option to make him a twelve million dollar a year left tackle, so he's going to be on the market too. Yeah. So we'll see what the what the market bears for those guys. Now, Giacomini missed a number of games with some back issues uh, last year. I think he only played in about five yeah. games. So uh, there's some health concerns, but again, that's something you can check out. I like his nastiness. I like his edge. I like. Uh, I just like the way that that he plays. I'd be far more interested in Breno than I would be in Okun, and which is crazy because Okun actually put together a healthy season last year. Well, here's the thing for me, having these guys with injury concerns now coming in and playing left tackle and right tackle. Now I'm not as bothered about the injury concern thing, because when you have when your backups are are guys that we saw play as starters this last year, you know that George Fant can be uh, I'm okay with him being the backup left tackle. I'm I'm, let him develop Okay with Gary Gilliam being the backup right tackle. Right. And Reese Odiambo being another, you know, solid backup in that right. mixture, plus whoever they draft, right? Right. So yeah, I would really love it if they in all honesty, if they chose either Okun or Breno to bring to bring back, if you can get him at the right number. We've seen that uh that what guys are going for right now is astronomical. I, I, I think it's highly unlikely you bring them both back, but if you can get one at a reasonable price, that would be great. Draft a guy for the other side and away we go. I, I'd be I'd be really excited about that. Well, like you said, I think Breno would be coming back. I think that's a, a no brainer as far as taking a risk, because I think the because of the injury concerns, I, I don't think he's going to be and, and because of his age, too. He's not going to be a high cost type of free agent acquisition. No, he should be a guy that's affordable within our cap structure. So and not only that, but, you know, he fits in the system. You know that Tom Cable likes the way that he plays. And you know that with him and a Fetty, say, on the right side, and Britt, then it's that right side of the line would be all sorts of nasty. <laughs> be all sorts of nasty. 
And I like I like that a lot. I mean, the one thing that and you talk that you do have concerns about though is the athleticism with Breno because being a, a few years older than he was, you know, in 2013 when he was here, he's he's lost a little bit of it. And, and back issues, you know, those types of injuries do not help with your athleticism. It could be bad, but then again, he spent a lot of the year resting. He could be good to go. So I, it's just something the doctors would need to check out. You need to work him out. See what's going on. If he's even interested in coming back to Seattle. I haven't heard anything out of his camp at all saying that that would be something that he'd be interested in. Now, you have heard that uh, Okun would possibly be interested in coming back to Seattle, even though some say that uh, after the negotiations last year that that relationship had soured a little bit. I found that to be BS at the time, and uh, the people bring it up again now. I mean, it's business. Business is business. Russell Okun's not a stupid guy. I mean, he's a real smart dude. Right. So I'm sure he didn't take it that personal. I mean, it is what it is. So, um, yeah, that would be it'd be cool either way. But again, a guy you know would work in your system. I think the only other guy that's out there, uh, free agency wise, when it comes to offensive lineman, that kind of piques my interest a little bit is uh, Beecham, the the tackle from the Jaguars, mm. formula for, or formerly from the Pittsburgh Steelers. You know, had a decent year last year, and then the <laughs> Jags decided to let him go. So. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> he's not a very good run blocker, I think, was his issue in Jacksonville. And that could be a concern coming to Seattle, though. Yeah, possibly. I mean, again, just a guy that I'm willing to take a look at. But I guess as far as and, rating out, he still rates out as a better run blocker than uh, George Fant. Well, there you go. Yeah, he actually touches somebody. But it's clear we got to get better. The one thing that scared me a little bit about Pete's press conference was the idea that he talked about how much room Fant had to grow this offseason because he's like, oh, heck, he's never really done anything before. So his leap the second year should be gigantic. Please, God, please, God, for the love of everything that's holy and all of the ligaments in Russell Wilson's knees, do not bank on the fact that George Fant is going to become an elite left tackle after one year of playing the position because, you know, he's going to line up against Robert Quinn. Good luck. (laughs) Well, we went through this last year, right? It was kind of that, uh, that same idea that Gary Gilliam was going to be your starting left tackle. Mm -hmm. So would it surprise you if they went through the off season thinking, making that determination? God. Yeah. I hope it surprises me. (laughs) No, it won't surprise yeah. you. I could tell. No, it, it would surprise me. It would legitimately surprise yeah. me. I mean, I, I just, I know. And then Schneider talked a little bit about the idea that they want to be a championship caliber team year in, year out, right? And so his philosophy and the way that he was describing that was you can't just go out and load up for for a run and then not compete for a couple yeah. of years. You know, when you hear that, it makes you wonder a little bit about how much they really are going to go after some offensive line help in that that respect but yeah it's a matter of whether they want to spend some free agent dollars or draft capital one of the two maybe you spend your free agent dollars going after another corner i don't know that hasn't been very successful yeah so, i that would surprise me a little bit i as far as we can talk about where the free agency money should go but in terms of offensive line that i could see it going several different ways man i <sighs> No way. You, you're you conflicted and have a bunch of different ideas of how it all might pan out and can't decide on well, one. Yeah, I know. I'm stunned, you're Brandon. Stunned. <laughs> I'm stunned. Ideally, to me, you go out and get Andrew Whitworth, right? <laughs> no. no. And then you don't have any money, money left. But uh, yeah, it's, it's too the, much kind of money. the sweet spot for a left tackle seems to be what Russell Ukun would command. And that's like seven to eight mm-hmm. million dollars a year, I would think. To me, that yes. seems right to, to fit that position. And now knowing that you have Fant as a backup to Okun, it, like I said, the injury, the injury issues that we are so concerned about with Russell Okun before, it does not seem as much of a concern as it did before, right? I'd rather have that risk there with the idea that maybe I at least get eight games out of Okun. Well, and if you're only you know and I mean? if you're only looking for eight games, maybe you're maybe you look at a guy like Ryan Clady, who's you know left the New York he Jets. He can't play anymore. Maybe you he look at uh, Matt Khalil for the Minnesota Vikings. He interests me. He interests me. That's that's a guy that's been up and down and had some injury issues. You know, the last couple of years that had seemed to have stunted his growth a little bit, but. Um, that's one of those guys that you look at that could end up being a rebound player and is still relatively young. So 
Uh, I like the idea of Matt Khalil. And there's an older guy, too. Jake Long filled in for Minnesota. And he had a decent year, too. So I'm I'm thinking we're just looking at guys that can fill the spot for a year or two. Yeah, that's exactly. These are Band-Aid guys. These are Band-Aid guys to to go over the gaping wounds that were the tackle positions last year. And that wouldn't necessarily cost you Andrew Whitworth type Uh, money. Yeah, because we're not going to be able to afford a player like Andrew Whitworth if we spend all that money to have Colin Kaepernick as our backup quarterback. (laughs) We're not even going there. Come on now. (laughs) (laughs) It was a ridiculous article. I had to bring it up. It's just a job. You got to you got to just roll your eyes and go, Okay. I looked down the the top 101 NFL free agents on on the NFL.com list. It's starting at the top. You have Andrew Whitworth at 24. We, I think we've already decided that's going to be too much. He's probably going to resign with the Bengals anyway. Uh, mm-hmm. So don't even consider that. Uh, you got Riley Reif from the Detroit Lions. He's the, the next guy on that list. Mm-hmm. And that's over on the uh, right side. And he's an older player. Yeah, but he... Riley Reif? Yeah. Yeah. He's still, I think, uh, in terms of free agents, he was top five performer out of, out of all the, the guys who are free agents on the offensive line. Sure. Uh, you got Ricky Wagner from the Baltimore Ravens coming off his rookie deal. He played at Wisconsin with Russell Wilson. So if there's somebody that oh. Russell Wilson should be getting on the phone with, you know, maybe it's there Ricky Wagner. And uh, he plays on the uh, on the right side as well. Mm-hmm. And actually rated out as the number two lineman. So he, he right. maybe a guy who'd be kind of expensive, but uh, maybe shore up that right side. Yeah. And then what do you do about the left side? Well, you, you make it work with a guy like Matt Khalil or, you know, um, or a draft or a draft pick or one of those kind of lower tier injury concern type guys that uh, yeah, pretty much name a Vikings offensive lineman. And he was injured last year and is as a free agent this year. Right. Right. Hey, we'll see. We'll see how that goes. But, you know, going down the list, the, the other guys that are left tackles, I think we've covered them already. Number 50, Russell Okung, Matt Khalil, number 67, uh, 72, Kelvin Beecham, number 80, Ryan Clady. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There you go. We'll see. Well, I mean, again, if John Schneider and he's truthful when he says this is truly aggressive in free agency is in he's in as many deals as he can possibly be in the mix of. He may not pull a trigger on very many because of the way the cap is this year but if he is aggressive he's going to kick the tires on pretty much every one of the dudes on that list you know he is one guy that's kind of interesting too all the way at 81 on the right side uh mike remmers from the carolina panthers he's coming off his rookie deal he went to oregon state he was undrafted into the nfl and Mm -hmm. uh he was a top five run blocker among all tackles he was the number one blocking uh right tackle and uh and pass blocking he rated out higher than gilliam so, yeah, I I did remember him having some issues with Von Miller in the Super Bowl. Yeah, well, but he uh, doesn't. But I, it would be worth it just to have for the primetime games. You know how they put up the the picture of the dude or the little video of the dude, and he <laughs> says who he is and where. He just to have Mike Remmers as a Seahawk for that, because man, he is a <laughs> he is a goofy looking dude. Man, it is hilarious well, on the bad lip reads. His are always the best. Uh, no, on YouTube, if you haven't looked him up, yeah. And he and Glowinski can have a beard growing competition. Mm-hmm. So yeah. I mean, I I, can, I see lots of uh, ways that he would tie in well with the team. He doesn't necessarily yeah. have the athleticism that I think the Seahawks look for at that right tackle position. But if you're looking at no. bringing in Breno too, uh, maybe it's uh, similar. Hey man, if you if you're a road grader and you can you can run block, I'm interested. Yeah, I'm interested. I mean, I'd love to say I would like to you know, go after pass protectors. But the thing is, is that the Seahawks aren't going to do that. So it's a matter of like being excited about the model that they have set forth <laughs> in, 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 in hope for guys that work well in that. Model. So we just wasted all our time talking about uh, the guys that we want as pass protectors. Well, no, I mean, they, again, Remmers can p- pass protect too. I mean, it's not, he's not the worst at it. That's just these are guys that like Breno Giacomini. We we talked about at length because he's a better run blocker than he is a pass protector. Sure, I'm glad you agree. <laughs> All right, good. <laughs> I was trying to look at other things, man. Trying to. Well, you know what other things you could look at, Brandon? Because this is a big news story. I didn't know if you knew this was going to happen. Earl Thomas is back for 2017. <laughs> That's a big news story. Friggin' stunned. <laughs> I think this is like the third or fourth uh, Earl Thomas is going to be back for 2017 story. 
Yeah, yeah. I, I, I saw that uh, pop up on my phone. I was like, no way. <laughs> wow. Had no idea. Didn't see that coming at all. No, you could. He is so ultra competitive. He's a guy that he wants to. He'll he'll be competing year to year until he can pretty much guarantee that he'll be, uh, you know, a, have a potential spot in the Hall of Fame. I, I feel like mm-hmm. that's where Earl Thomas's mindset is. He doesn't want to be oh, content yeah. with with just going out as as having a, you know, a couple a few good years as a as a safety. He wants to be a Hall of Fame safety. He wants to be one of the greats. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. So, no, he he's going to be back. Uh, another story that I thought uh, was kind of fell into the no way category <laughs> was uh, was uh, Jimmy Graham will be back with the team next year. Both uh, Pete Carroll and John Schneider talked about that. So yeah, that, was that a question? Again, that was, <laughs> again, exactly. It fell under the, the no way category. Um, so, yeah. You know, fun Is Russell Wilson going to be back as quarterback this this coming season? Uh, Do we need there. to ask that question? It's still there. He might want to. He want to take a couple seasons off to be a dad. You know, let Ciara work. Yeah. and do, you know, pursue her career. Well, they they did ask about Ash Schneider about Richard Sherman too, and uh, kind of liked his response. No, I mean he, he's an elite player. I mean, um, you know, I think everybody, I think everybody has bad days. You know, um, congratulations if you don't. Um, but no, he's we love him. He's an elite player. Yeah, that that might be one of my favorite John Schneider quotes of all time. Everybody has bad days. Congratulations <laughs> if you don't. You know, I mean, how many times have we said that on the pod? I mean, geez, Louise. But uh, yeah, I mean, he's an elite player. You know, you're gonna put up with him being a little bit of a knucklehead now and then. You know, right. And it turns out that uh, Richard Sherman was back in the news this last week. And looking at the headlines, it it was. Uh, <laughs> it took me a while to get to this story. Because after the headlines, I was thinking, OK, this is just, an, you know, another Richard Sherman story where he says, you know, something a little silly and, and the media takes off with it. Uh, here's just a, a sampling of the headlines. Richard Sherman takes a page out of the quote unquote fake news playbook. That uh, was from mm-hmm. Pro Football Talk. Uh, here's one from Seattle Times. It's official. You can't take Seahawks Richard Sherman seriously anymore. And uh, another one from Seattle. Richard Sherman's revisionist history is insulting. And and so I, I saw the and I, I had to check out his interview that he did with ESPN's Kerry Champion. And after I watched this interview, Adam, I mm-hmm. it, it took me a couple of watches to for to really strike me as to what my my big problem with it was. But right. It was the first time you listened to it. There was something there that didn't feel right. And you kind of had to go back through it a couple of times to kind of pin it down. Yeah. Because I haven't listened to it yet. I just saw the comments and, and, and read a little bit about oh, good. it. So I'm interested to, to what you thought about it. Okay, well, let me start you out with just the isolated clip in question that I think sparked all of the controversy. After you and that guy got into it, uh, did you feel like, oh, man, maybe I shouldn't have said what I said? No, because nobody ever knew what I said. Once again, sources say, no, who was there? Did anybody see it? You know, who was there? Who said who so said it? So it was not correct. No, nobody knows. Nobody knows what was correct. All you hear is he say, she say. Well, you I'm know. asking you, was it incorrect? It was incorrect how they portrayed it, yes. It gets to the point where nobody needs the truth anymore. Nobody cares to... to to know what the truth is. You could just fabricate a story and go with it. Then I got to de- defend a fabricated story. After a while, you just get irritated of, of, of defending stories that don't exist. So it's like, why would, I, why would I talk to you when I can write my own story? So here's a question for you, Adam. Mm-hmm. Which guy did Richard Sherman get into it with? Oh, interesting. Okay, because I my, my question was, when I listened to it was, um, what statements are we talking about? Like, what, what did he say? Like, that was... Because I, you know, it was just all. Do you take back what you said? And he's like, no. And like, it was never, it was never made clear like what statements they were even discussing, right? That he was going right. back about. Let alone what guy he even got it into, right? Well, uh, like, where, where, what was the question before that? I guess would be. Well, they didn't. They didn't show question. the question before. They played a package right before that statement. Like they, what do you they, mean, they a broke package? out. So the, the entire, uh, the entire three and a half minutes was Carrie champion interviewing Richard Sherman for about mm-hmm. 15 seconds before this one clip. You know how sometimes they play, uh, other clips uh, in between the actual yeah. talking. Right. Well, to try to give you some context. Yeah. Possibly. This just wasn't clips. This was an actual produced package. And just to give you an idea, I, I, this isn't the one that they played. 
But just to give you an idea, this is a package that I put together so you could see just how uh, how the media can can kind of direct your thinking. People close their ears once they once you do something, you know, once you anger them or frustrate them, tell them what they don't want to hear. Show them, oh, he's disrespecting the flag. Bang. No more listening. This happening in Seattle. Two former Seattle Seahawks, a legion of boom teammates, one of whom now plays for the New England Patriots, appeared to be angrily screaming at each other. Thanks to this very intense photo, many believe Brandon Browner was jawing with Richard Sherman. After you and that guy got into it, did you feel like, oh man, maybe I shouldn't have said what I said? No, because nobody ever knew what I said. See? Totally works with Brandon Browner in there. That was one that I put in. That just just for fun. Just to show you. Oh, that's not what they played beforehand? No, that wasn't what they played beforehand. Oh, very sneaky. Okay. All right. <laughs> but I do right. I, hear, if you want to hear what was played beforehand. Yes, I okay, do. Okay, here it okay. is. Oh, he's disrespecting the flag. Bang. No more listening. This happening in Seattle. Sherman got into it with local Seattle radio reporter Jim Moore. You don't want to go there. You do not. I'll ruin your career, said Sherman. After you and that guy got into it, did you feel like, oh, man, maybe I shouldn't have said what I said? No, because nobody ever knew what I said. But see, that one doesn't make sense to me because we had recordings of Richard Sherman getting into it with Jim Moore. So you wonder if maybe she asked a question about another dude that he had gotten into it with, and that's what they were talking about, like whether it was Crabtree or you know any of the other, like what, the bagel guy on uh, Fifth yeah. Street. Because you know he's getting into it with somebody like <laughs> that, every that day. That was the easiest you know? thing for me to find was clips of Richard Sherman getting into it with somebody uh, to find right. for this clip because I, I could have played him getting into it with Skip Bayless. I could have played him getting into it with Michael Crabtree. I could have played him getting into it with uh, Brandon Marshall or, or Rex Ryan. There, there were so many examples of Sherman getting into it with with some coach, uh, whether it was on another team, whether it was his own coach, whether it was the right. defensive backs coach. I, there were so many examples, so, and I yeah. don't know if that was the start of the question because – I played the the clip leading into it. It was Richard right. Sherman talking about uh, Colin Kaepernick, mm-hmm. and right. and then it goes into the package, and then it goes into her question about quote unquote that guy. So you could put it's an odd transition. You could yeah. put anything in there, and I, I I went back and I found what I think actually makes the most sense and put it in there. Bang! No more listening. <laughs> This happening in Seattle. There was a blown coverage by the Seahawks, and Richard Sherman starts going off. He just starts railing on the backup safety because Cam Chancellor's not playing. He's out. They're getting into it, and they're screaming at each other, and then Richard's screaming at somebody else, and somebody's screaming at him. Then the entire defense is surrounding Richard Sherman. After you and that guy got into it, did you feel like, oh, man, maybe I shouldn't have said what I said? No, because nobody ever knew what I said. Once again, sources say. All right. Well, here's the only reason why I don't think that would fit. Okay. Because I don't think she would just call Cam that guy. Well, the backup. Uh, McRae. Oh, okay. Well, then that, that could be, that could make sense. So the real question then comes down to, do you feel like, Carrie Champion in ESPN has journalistic integrity, or do you believe that ESPN and Carrie Champion and all of those guys over there at the at the mothership uh, chase ratings and like to make controversy? Judging by the number of clips that came out of it, it uh, it's it wouldn't hurt them to generate controversy. Okay. I have a lot of respect for Carrie Champion, so I don't know if she right. would would do this intentionally or if it'd be people at ESPN. Or the producers, right. It makes no sense to me. Richard Sherman knew that that interaction with Jim Moore was recorded. And right. so for him to, to talk about it as though people didn't know what happened, it doesn't make sense to me. And that's why it really threw me off. Because... Look, I, so Richard Sherman's a Stanford-educated guy, right? He's a very smart individual. Yeah. And I, I'm sure that he's watched uh, the discourse in America over the last like you know six to eight months and realizes that you can discredit and say anything you want about anything and it doesn't even matter. Like it doesn't even matter if it's true. You can just be like, nah, that didn't happen. Nah, that's <laughs> fake. Nah. And, and, and nobody cares. Nobody cares. Somebody will try to care, but it doesn't even matter. 
Like, if you do enough of it, nobody will... Maybe he's just recognizing that you can deflect criticism by just creating a million you know, little controversies so that you can't ever focus on one, and it's all just fake. I think it makes more sense that he had no idea which incident that she was referring to. Richard Sherman gets into it with so many guys that if you say if you're getting into it with that guy, his, his wheels are spinning thinking, okay, who is it that I got into it with? And the fact that there's no yeah. clarification that they had to insert a little package right in between for the to help further this discussion to help tie something well, to that. Okay, clip. in the defense of, in the defense of ESPN on that, how many people outside of South Alaska, I mean Seattle, <laughs> had actually heard the beef between local radio guy Jim Moore and Richard Sherman? So when you're questioning Not Richard many. Sherman on it. Why don't you give the background as part of the question? Well, is it a slicker? Is it a slicker piece? Uh, if you have just Sherman and and Carrie going back and forth about Jim Moore and having her just bring it up in the form of a question, or is it a slicker package that she asks him about it and you know kind of gets the conversation started and then to you know prime the pump for the viewer so that they understand the context of it, put in the, the you know, little sensational soundbite beforehand. All I'm saying is it sparked enough of a question in my mind that I want to see the raw, unedited version of the interview, because then, then we would know for sure. Well, uh, get your Freedom of Information Act all filled out, and we'll see if we can get... Uh, I, I don't know think, ESPN's I don't not a government ESPN agency. is a government agency that you can FOIA. I don't care. I don't care. I'm so, you can still try. You can still try. I'll have to uh, at least fill out the form and, and find a place to send it into ESPN. But yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Just send it right to Carrie. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I want to know what your full question was before this. All right. Well, I appreciate I appreciate the effort and sleuthing that you did there, Brandon. Like, uh, that was uh, that was interesting. Coming, coming to the defense of your quarterback, man. <laughs> That's my quarterback, man. That's my quarterback. Uh, yeah, it just some. It just it, it struck me weird that that's the one place that you choose to insert a produced package, yeah. and maybe it was just because the question came out of nowhere. But uh, yeah, maybe based off of Sherman's response, it was so generic it could fit anybody that yeah. uh, <laughs> that he had a, some kind of interaction with. True fact. True fact. What do you say we uh, wrap this up, get to the second half of the show, get on to some do better, better at life, and uh, we've got some reviews and a call. Oh, awesome. Fantastic. Let's hit it up. Seahawkers Podcast is the official podcast of the official booster club of the Seattle Seahawks. In Seahawkers news, I see that uh, they're taking Seahawker of the Year nominations. So it's that time of year again. Check with your chapter president if you have somebody you want to nominate for Seahawker of the Year. I don't understand why anybody would nominate anybody. It's clearly me. Like, don't. Well, you have to be nominated. Surely, surely there's a listener out there that's that'll nominate. Adam Wait Emmer. a second. Why would I have to nominate? Why would I have to be nominated? It should just be clear. <laughs> like, I, I mean, I just this is dumb. Why even ask for nominations is what you're saying. Yeah, I don't need to be. It just just duh. Just give me the <laughs> award. Like, come on. Well, I will look forward to being at your award presentation <laughs> at the at the Seahawker annual banquet this year, Adam. <laughs> Fantastic. You know, we should we should probably put out to folks, too, if if they aren't a member, well, they can't be Seahawker of the Year, but if they want to become a member, uh, then go to Seahawkers.org. They can find a Seahawkers group near them. They're all over, all over the country, all over the world. Uh, there There's places out there. Go to Seahawkers.org. Check it out and join a club near you. There's a military chapter. You can join the military Seahawkers for free at military Seahawkers.org. Yeah. Now, all sorts of clubs and look in all the people that you'll meet, they have the sickness too. Right. Like these are, these are people just like you. I mean, they'll, they'll talk to you for like an hour or two over offensive tackle prospects. Yeah. Like they'll, they'll do that with you. They're, they're so just like you. It's <laughs> yeah. It's good for, it's good for your deal. And then that way your spouse uh, doesn't have to hear about it anymore. Right. Cause they're, they don't, they don't care. They don't care what uh, uh, force lamps uh, shuttle time was. <laughs> They don't care unless you met your wife or husband through a Seahawkers gathering. Then they probably do wow. have the sickness just like you. See, if you do that, you're looking for love in all the right places. 
<laughs> don't go to these dating sites. Go to a Seahawkers yeah. chapter uh, <laughs> meeting. Yeah, we need more. We need Seahawkers mixers. That's what we need. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. All right. And uh, moving on. We got a couple calls. We have a few reviews. We also have a new member of the flock. Wow. Welcome to the flock to Alvaro Abascal. Checking in from Spain with a Russell Wilson donation wow. via PayPal. And then he, he donated via PayPal and then hit the subscribe button at gettingtheflock.com. So uh, wow, Alvaro man. just uh, subscribing in all the places. Dude, appreciate it a ton, uh, especially over there in Spain. I mean, that's that's really cool. I, the idea I, I had never thought about the idea that we might have people listening in Spain, but apparently it happens. And uh, uh, apparently are entertaining enough to... Uh, Get your donation, and we appreciate it a ton, man. Uh, it helps us get to our goal of 300 patrons yes. uh, that we're hoping to get to by when? Did we set a date on that? Or that's just where we, we want to try to get to? Trying to get there by the, the start of the year, the start of the season. Start of the regular yeah, season? Yeah, let's go week one. Week one. All right. So, yeah, let's do that, people. So, get in the flock.com, be like uh, Elvero, and uh, you can get. You know, bonus content. You can get on on the Pick'em League, the patrons only Pick'em League, and it'll be it'll be awesome, man. So thanks again, and thanks to all of the you guys that are considering it, uh, because that's the first step to to actually making a donations. You have to consider you have to first. consider so start first. considering yeah. it right now. <laughs> yeah. Well, and this came in on Wednesday, and I have to think that he was probably sitting there wondering when the next show was going to come out. And so if you if you yeah. find yourself checking your phone to see if a new show is, is downloaded. I think that's a great time to go to get in the and, right. and start to consider to support the show. Yeah. If you've looked at your phone more than twice, <laughs> anticipating a new, a, a new show coming out, then it's yeah, you, you enjoy it well enough to where like a dollar a month. Isn't crazy. <laughs> I think you can get that done. Some other people who enjoy the show. We had quite a few reviews come in from iTunes this week. So let's run down no the way, list. Really? Yeah, we had four of them come in then just this last week. Holy smokes. Okay. First one from Marshawn2472 says, Great show. <laughs> That's a solid, solid handle, man. Yeah, this might even be no, this isn't this isn't Marshawn Lynch because uh it says, I love Adam's rants. I am a bandwagon fan, but I am only 10 years old. Oh, well, that's fair. <laughs> and no, you're not a bandwagon fan if you're 10 years old. You've just chosen your team. You're only a bandwagon right. team. You're only a bandwagon fan if you choose to go root for another team. Right. You just you become a bandwagon fan when you stop rooting for the right. team. I was a Cowboys right. bandwagon fan from from about uh, 12 to, I don't know, 16. Right. So this is Marshawn 2472 is already a better human being than you are at the age of 10. Right. Like he picked the right team right out of the gate or she did. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, next one from Michael in San Diego. And uh, maybe we need to cue the music because, you know, Michael <laughs> right. in San Diego. is it breakfast <laughs> time? Breakfast time. <laughs> Says great right. podcast for Seahawks fans. This is a great show for casual and diehard Seahawks fans alike. Brandon, even though his name is spelled wrong and Adam have great chemistry and great commentary on the team. Sure. They're fanboys, but they also have very realistic views and call out bad decisions or players when they see them. They regularly have rival team podcast hosts on the show to get their perspective on the Seahawks as well as their own team. And these conversations help me gain a different insight on those teams that I don't really follow. If you're a Seahawks fan, you'll enjoy the show. If you aren't, you might too. As an added bonus, if you prove your emails are worthy, they provide custom background music that is played while your email is read. <laughs> Signed, Michael in San Diego. And and since, yeah. you know, it's not just improving your emails are worthy. I mean, since Michael is the only Seahawks fan I know who routinely has breakfast the morning of every Seahawks game, if, if right. that's not worthy of your own theme music, then I don't know what is. Yeah, I don't either. And uh, yeah, and making your own breakfast doesn't count. No. So <laughs> that's that's not that's not in there. So thank you, Michael. Thank you for everything you do. Thanks for taking one for the team every Sunday. You're a good man in a in a scholar. Here's one from R and R in Washington. Seahawkers is the best Seahawks podcast for the twelves. These two guys provide great info and have an awesome segment called Better at Life. So by subscribing to this podcast, you are already better at life than Skip Bayless. Awesome. Thanks a lot, RR. And, uh, you, it's true. It's very easy to become awesome. 
you know, you just you just hit subscribe and like already you're better than eighty percent of the population. That's below average. <laughs> so it works out great for you. MD11 slash DC10 off season so far so good. My brother turned me on to this podcast. I enjoyed it all season. The guys have some solid insight into the Hawks. I was a little concerned it might drop off a bit or a lot during the off season, but I'm pleasantly surprised that it really hasn't. I love Adam saying do better hasn't failed to make me smile yet. These guys are true fans. Keep it up. Go Hawks. Go Hawks, man. And you know what I like about those last two reviews back to back right there? It, one person loves better at life and the other person loves to do better. <laughs> like our two like most consistent things. Yeah. That's awesome, man. Yeah. Because better at life was kind of like your brainchild from week one. And, and do better. Very first I, show. I think it was probably only six or seven episodes in when we realized yeah. that you clearly needed to tell somebody to do better week to week. <laughs> yeah, it was just it was just in me every <laughs> week. I didn't know I needed to get it out. It's more it's more instead of having to you know pay a therapist. Right. Like and now I get I get to put it out there like this, and you guys help me work through this. <laughs> you know, you the listeners. So I appreciate it. And we got a call from Jeremy in California via the 206. Let's hear what Jeremy had to say. So, my name is Brandon. I really enjoyed the last podcast. I thought it was uh, your best one of the last year. I agree with you. I don't know what the Seahawks fans are thinking about when they're saying cut Jimmy Graham or cut Cam Chancellor. That's ridiculous. If you cut Jimmy Graham, then now you have to go get a new weapon on offense. And that's going to cost more in free agency than the money you'd save from signing. Same with Cam. If you cut Cam, now you have to sign a strong safety. And even if you sign a number 10 strong safety, it's probably going to cost as much as Cam is now. So you'd actually be losing money to do something like that. Anybody that doesn't understand that, I I feel like is really misinformed about how NFL salaries work. So I I agree with you on everything. I think waiting on Justin Britt makes sense, but keeping everybody else is awesome. And to all the Seahawks fans that are whinging about, name me one NFL team that has drafted better than the Seahawks over the last six years. You can't. Name me one NFL team that has less wasted money in free agency. You can't. Look at other teams and the amount of money that's wasted on their least favorite players. The Seahawks do a good job of bringing people in, trying it, and if it doesn't work out, they're not going to lose a lot of money because of it. If Seahawks fans want the offensive line to get better, and I think we all do, all that we need to do is just be patient and draft maybe a little bit better. But our all five guys are coming back next year. Uh, while we might hope that all five are going to get better, I would anticipate most of them are going to get better, but maybe one or two take a step back. And that's why we want to have competition. Anyways, love the show, especially the last one. Keep up the good work. Go Hawks. Go Hawks, Jeremy. Go Hawks, Jeremy. I, I, I love it when people call in. It tickles me to no end. It really does. I like hearing people's voice and hearing them talk with the, the amount of passion and um, and especially when they bring the facts, reason, and logic. Yeah. Like Jeremy did in that call. I mean, the, the idea that he talked about the idea of replacement costs, right? Okay, fine. You get rid of Cam and then you, but there's a base amount of money you got to pay, you know, another dude to be there. So the overall savings ends up being nil or, like he mentioned, even possibly a net loss, depending on, you know, where salaries go in free agency. So right. if you uh, knew, a lot if of great you points. knew Nick Vanette was going to be as good or better than Jimmy Graham, then yeah, you cut Jimmy Graham and let him go because you sure. have a guy that costs less that's going to be as good or better or even marginally close, but he's not. He's not quite, He's not that caliber of player. Now, I know John Schneider and Pete Carroll are high on him and maybe he develops into a stronger player, but it, that, it's not the time and you don't have... You clearly, we've seen Cam Chancellor what happens when he's out versus when he's in he's a difference maker when he's in you can't get rid of the cam either yeah exactly and it's i'm I'm glad to hear that there's some other people that have the same thought process as we do i think uh, my guess would be is that the people that are talking about you know getting rid of jimmy getting rid of cam and things like that are in the minority of 12 so that'd be my guess well and you just it's that emotional response of after having a losing season you you just you it wasn't a losing well, season. Uh, you, you just didn't, you win, just the didn't Super win the Super Bowl, Bowl right? See, it didn't that's live. where we're at as Seahawks fans with mentality. That slip, that slip of the tongue, shows exactly where people's mindsets are. They really did look at this last season as a losing season. Right. There's a lot of fans that looked at it that way. Whereas the 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 reality is, you lost in the divisional round of the playoffs right. after winning your division. 
You know what? That's not a losing season. <laughs> it's a losing season, but you it ended you on a want, loss. But you, you know. want to find ways that you can get better, and so you start looking at skill positions to where you can improve. And I don't care about spending Paul Allen's money. Let's go out and spend all of the Paul Allen money <laughs> to, to try yeah, and get no, better. Neither does Paul Allen. <laughs> like uh, he's he's fine. He's fine. He's flush enough. Right. Like yeah. In like the next fourteen generations of his family, yeah. they're going to be all right. <laughs> So go out and get all the best players. We haven't talked about even getting Clayus Campbell back or getting Clayus Campbell from the Arizona Cardinals. I think we need to look at that. Maybe we look at that next week. But there's mm-hmm. other free agents out there that I, I know that the yeah. Seahawks can get at positions of need that can make this team better. OK, so for heading into next week, I would like everybody that uh, listens to the show and, and likes interacting with the show to uh, email the show and tell me. If you had to choose between bringing in somebody like Calais Campbell to play defensive line uh, with your free agency money or bring in somebody like Russell Okun to play left tackle, who would you choose? Who would you choose? Write in and and let us know on that because that is going to be a discussion for next week. I like it. Let, let's say you have, because you have to leave a little bit of cap room. Let's say you can go out and get... Let's give listeners 15 million worth of cap space. Two guys that they can sure. fit, or even three guys that they think can fit in. Or as many guys as you can under 15 million. Realistically. Realistically. Be realistic with your numbers. Yeah. One Andrew exactly. Whitworth. Or, or a myriad of other yeah. dudes. Yeah. Uh, it's a good exercise. I like that. So you'll email that into the show, guys. GoHawks at SeahawkersPodcast.com. Or give us a call and record us a message just like Jeremy did at 253-235-9041. I have to have you do it every time because I still don't remember. I know. This. It's in the show notes, too. 253-235-9041. Awesome. And uh, thanks for everybody uh, for the kind reviews as well. We appreciate it a ton. Yeah. Big, uh, it helps out quite a bit, especially in the off season when you can look and see and people are enjoying the show through the off season, even when... Uh, Which stuns me. Even when they <laughs> expected maybe it might fall off during the off season. But no, we're delivering. That's a reasonable expectation, by the way. <laughs> That's a reasonable expectation. It's true. <laughs> yeah. Well, what do you say we get on to do better and better at life? All right, man. Who you got? My do better this week is for the Seattle Seahawks, Adam. What? The Seattle wait. Seahawks. Hey, wait, wait. Beep, beep, back the truck up. <laughs> this is the Seahawkers podcast, Brandon. We're fanboys. We don't say anything bad about the team ever. We we do. We're homers. We say negative things when they need to be said. And I... Oh, we do. Y- okay. You and I, we enjoy good conspiracy theories. And mm-hmm. I think... I think I found something here. Once the Seahawks saw Adam run the 40 in the Todd Gurley jersey. They were right. they were so worried he was going to smoke the rest of the Seahawks media competition that Adam Emmert did not get an invite to the Seahawks media combine. And to me, that's a disgrace. And the Seahawks need to do better. Yeah, that was bull- catfish. That's what that was, Brandon. You know, the Seahawks talk about all the time how competitive they are, how they're always looking under every rock to find you know somebody that can that can play. They find their special skill sets and things like that. And I know somebody on the scouting staff had to see my yeoman's effort through the knee deep snow and, uh, you know, the, the amount of heart and grit that I showed throughout that 40 and to not even get an invite to even compete. I know that's a No, no, that's an insult. It's an insult because, yeah, you know, I would have whipped Danny O'Neill's ass at that. You know, I would have. <laughs> I know. For, like, see, and here's the problem. I know for a fact that Seahawks.com writer John Boyle saw that video because I tweeted it at him and he responded. And still, there was no invite. He responded. Yes. He responded and he didn't go to bat for us. <laughs> he responded that you had a good effort. Yeah. Yeah. Because it was. It was Like I said, it was a yeoman's effort. So if you don't get an invite I haven't next seen year, anybody else try to run problems. the 40 in knee deep snow. No. I haven't seen anybody else try Nobody to do did. it. Yeah. You're the only one. So, yeah. Do better. I better get an invite next year. <laughs> exactly. We got to see we got to see who we need to contact about. Well, it to me that's why I think this this conspiracy runs deep because I don't think they want you there. I think you're a threat. That's right. I am a threat. And I'm coming for you guys next year. <laughs> no, you're not cuz you're not getting an invite. You're, you're too good. Just wait till they just wait till they see me see my vertical jump, man. <laughs> Woo! Them Norwegian hops are large. <laughs> I don't know if they are. I think you're. Uh, I think you're exaggerating. <laughs> Maybe it's hard telling that now. 
All right. Uh, my do better this week, Brandon, is for the ornithological disaster, the death pool that is U.S. Bank Stadium in Minnesota. The <laughs> new stadium for the Minnesota Vikings is a death trap for our feathered friends that fly through the sky. I don't know if you've noticed, but the, the stadium itself is covered like 99% in glass, right? Uh -huh. And officials were warned up and down that this was going to cause mass death for birds in the Minneapolis-St. Paul area. Just in the last 11 weeks, Brandon, 60 dead birds were found on the sidewalk Holy by smokes. people just walking around. And that doesn't even count all the ones that they were picking up that you didn't see, plus another 14 more stunned birds. Like these birds have no they have no chance. It looks like more sky. They fly right into it and they kill them off. These the heartless bastards that built this stadium are killing off our songbirds in record numbers, and there's actual scientific evidence that you can use different glasses that have a little bit of a different coating that make a gigantic difference and cut this down by 80%. That was brought to their attention before they built this stadium, and to save a buck or two on their billion-dollar, partially public-funded stadium, they chose to not go with it to the death of many of our feathered friends, in the Midwest, and for that, the death trap that is U.S. Bank Stadium of America, do better. I would have to think of all the people that listen to this show are going to be bird fans. I mean, we're fans of that's a bird team. Saying. Man, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, I think Minnesota yeah, is... may be my new nemesis team. Yeah, yeah, they have no regard for ornithological life. They don't. That's disappointing. It's a death trap. It's a death trap. <laughs> On to better at life. All right, man. My better at life this week is for NRK Beta. And this is okay. probably a technology company that you've you've never heard of. I think that's a solid assumption. Yeah. They they came up with an idea that I think is going to revolutionize the internet. No. Oh. And and what they've done is they put a go to the comments section of any article. And and just read the comments. Yeah, I see you shaking your head already, Adam. It's brutal. <laughs> it's it's pretty gnarly. It's pretty gnarly. Which again makes me wonder how the review section on our show like looks the way that it does. I'm stunned. NRK Beta. What they did is to be able to actually comment on a particular story. They put in a little quiz, a little quiz to make sure you actually read the story before you make a comment. Ooh, I love this. And by doing this, they've actually improved the comment section on stories. So to me, this, this, is the easy, this is one of the easiest answers ever. I mean, you saw places go from, uh, you know, being able to be anonymous to making them use their Facebook mm -hmm. profiles. Mm -hmm. So at least it was, uh, you know, not so anonymous as before. No, that didn't that doesn't stop people. <laughs> people don't care whether they're anonymous or not. Not, not really. There's a lot of keyboard warriors out there. That's for sure. <laughs> So find out and make sure that people actually read the story that they're that they're making a comment on. And if they pass that little test, then they can actually make a comment. To me, this makes nothing but sense. And NRK beta for coming up with it. Better at life than Skip Bayless. I like it. That's an ingenious little uh, work of technology there. I'm very impressed because it really the comment sections on just about anything is just it's so nasty. It's so nasty. I don't understand all the all the hate. I mean, you can disagree with people all the time. Like that's fine, you know, but I mean, geez, like some of the stuff that's said on there is gnarly. And it does make you wonder oftentimes if they just read the headlines, scroll to the bottom and just start talking. Catfish. Right. <laughs> that's exactly what happens. 90% right. of the time. So I, think. I, I, so I think this is a, a, a great service to uh, mankind. This might just save us as a species. Yeah. Three or four questions to make sure you actually got the substance and the content that was in the article. No, oh, that's awesome, man. So see that that test for iTunes is built in because you have to have listened to the show to review it. Oh no way! Well, you don't have to, but I mean, if you're going to make a, a semi-intelligent comment, oh okay, gotcha. All right. I mean, why would you waste your time otherwise? There's lots of other podcasts you can comment on and not listen to. That's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> why would you pick this one? Hard telling. Hard telling. All right, man. My better at life than Skip Bayless this week is for Slovako striker Francis Cohn. Or Coney. I don't know how he says his last name. I'm going to go with Coney. It just sounds better. Francis Coney. And basically, 
Uh, just recently here in a Czech First League soccer match uh, between Slovakia and the Bohemians, which uh, I don't know if those are actual real teams. Those, ne- those names sound made up. <laughs> they sound made up. Yeah. But uh, basically there was a... Uh, a, a ball kicked towards the, the, the net. It was like, I, I don't know soccer people. So all of you in Europe right now, you're, you're losing your mind because I can't describe this at all. <laughs> but basically the, the whole point is, is that it was a breakaway uh, dude for uh, the Slovakia team uh, was running like full throttle, like dead at the goalkeeper. The goalkeeper's running, you know, dead at him away from the net and boom, they collide. And it was a ferocious collision. I mean, this was, Camp Chancellor Vernon Davis level kind of collision. I mean, it was nasty. Both wow. dudes just get exploited. Like they're just they're, expo- <laughs> they're just expo- it was so bad you made up a word. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. This- they exploited all over. <laughs> they did, and uh, man, it was it was bad. And what the first thing that happened was the Bohemians goalkeeper uh, Martin Brokovic. I mean, that that's close as I can get. Martin Brokovic. Um, he was unable to breathe after the collision. Like he oh, wow. literally couldn't breathe. Um, so uh, Francis Coney, the uh, player for the other team, um, recognized the situation. This is honestly not something he hasn't seen before. This has happened before in a soccer match, and he knew exactly what to do. He opened up the dude's mouth and pulled his tongue out because he was trying to swallow his own tongue while wow. he was unconscious. Saved his life on the field. This isn't the first time he's done this, mind you. This is at least the second time that this man has saved another man's life on the soccer field. I'm so impressed. What a what a mark of sportsmanship and humanity. Better at life than Skip Bayless, Francis Coney. Wow, that actually makes you want to watch soccer. No. I don't know. You could see a dude's life get saved after getting blown up. Yeah. This sounds interesting to me. Yeah, but then you had to you had to sit through another fifty nine <laughs> minutes uh, that you don't see on a clock because then there's untimed minutes after that that <laughs> go a random amount that you don't know and uh, and watch guys just run back and forth to maybe you know have one score the entire game. <laughs> no thanks, I'm out. It'll be about as exciting as the Oscars were this year, I guess. I thought that was exciting. I thought like things got messed up at the end and like you know, but it was at the end. You had to wait through the whole show to find out that they messed up. Oh. That's why you just hear the news reports of it. Why would you ever watch the Oscars in the first place? I don't know. People like movies. Sure. Go watch a movie then. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I, I've never understood the award show thing. The at thing all. is with the award show, if it doesn't have cartoons or superheroes, like I've probably not heard or seen any of those movies. Like now that I'm a parent and not able to go to the movie theater <laughs> twice a week. Uh, right. I, I'm I'm limited in scope of of my movie enjoyment, and usually to, it's uh, PG and under. Usually PG <laughs> and under. Yeah. yeah, and if it's an adult movie, it has superheroes. Mm-hmm. If it's a kids movie, it has cartoons. So right. that's that's my that's, that's your that's genre the these days. Yeah, that's, right. Or comedy. Yeah, which right. also you don't see those in the in the movie awards either. I thought don't they have a comedy section in the movie awards? I think that's in the Golden Globes. I like how we decided to stop calling the Oscars uh, Oscars and movie awards instead. (laughs) The movie awards. Movie awards. Yeah. Maybe Oscars is trademarked like Olympics and uh, Super Bowl. All right, Adam. Well, good show this week. We'll get into more free agency talk next week. And uh, sounds like we may have Rob Staten set up for to come on and talk about a little post combine action. Awesome, man. Awesome. I'd love to hear his thoughts. Because, yes, by the time you're hearing this, you've probably watched some of the Combine or at least heard yeah. that it's going on. I want to know if Ro- if Rob loves Lamp. Yes. <laughs> I, I think from what I've read so far, the, the 33-inch arm thing could be a deal breaker, though. I think he likes Lamp. Okay. But I don't know he's if he loves like him. He's in with Lamp? I don't know if he not, loves he him love because him? His, his arms are too short. Somewhere Steve Carell is very sad that he doesn't love Lamp. He just likes Lamp. <laughs> I love lamp. <laughs> I love lamp too. <laughs> All right. I think with that, there's only one thing left to say. Go Hawks. Go Hawks. Go Hawks.